My name is Björn Goldstein. Björn, yes. <laughs> okay. And um, yes, um, to make one thing very transparent right from the beginning, I'm not a psychologist. As you might assume, I, I am a trained political uh, a scientist. But uh, over the years, I studied very much political psychology and also taught political psychology at uh, the University of Bielefeld and the University of Münster in Germany. If we talk about biases, very, very much it is related to our identities. And this is the major part I'm talking about today, but before I'm talking about a, a few other things. But to make it uh, right from the beginning clear what I mean, um, if you see this cartoon here, Barack Obama, um, he is a person um, who represents different identities. So it's well known that we have multiple identities that are not, not just one identity we have. We have gender identities, national identities, religious identities, and whatever. And um, he was representing these identities in public um, as, of course, the American president or the president of the United States, as well as a member of the uh, uh, Afro-American community, which already is a problem because his mother was white and uh, his father was from Kenya. So that is also already, uh, yeah, not clear identical, or uh, cle it's not clear for him to identify with this Afro-American community. And um, on the other hand, he was like a uh, representative in the world for a strand of, uh, let's, let's call it uh, cosmopolitanism. Um, and all these different identities he had to represent as one person and um, in, in, in one function as the American president. And this is, of course, leading to conf conflicts. So that's why in this uh, stereotypical uh, image of a uh, psychoanalytic setting, he says it's complicated. So that is the first thing. The other thing, because I'm not going to talk about it very much tonight, is um, this here, it's complicated. It's actually absolutely useless to start a presentation, uh, the first slide saying it's complicated, because this is one uh, um, good way to make you shut off already, right from the beginning, because you might think it's too complicated for you. This phenomenon is called uh, priming, and especially in political propaganda, this is uh, very much made use of. And um, so don't be afraid, it's not too complicated. It was just what the, what the um, cartoon was saying um, in reference to identities. Important is this, equal access to relevant information, as you may already guess, is hard to have. So people have never equal access to information. Information is held back. There are language barriers and all kinds of other barriers, like uh, knowing how to uh, uh, um, use databases and so on or not. Um, and uh, discourses in politics are very hardly uh, um, fair and transparent. So in, in reality, um, we do not match what uh, the famous uh, philosopher Jürgen Habermas called a discourse without domination, which would be like the ideal discourse where the best argument prevails, the best rational argument. This we do not have in reality. Um, and what I'm talking about tonight mostly is this here in the middle, the rational actors. It is, um, it is an ideal that people in politics behave rationally. Um, in fact, they don't, because human beings do not behave rationally in, uh, yeah, most, most of the time. It happens, um, but it's not their usual uh, mode of conduct. So, a little bit uh, more about rationality in politi political decision-making. It was an ideal, in, especially in Europe after the Enlightenment period, that rationality is actually what should lead us to the best way to come to, 
to figure out what is the best way to live within a society, how to come to uh, political uh, uh, solutions, and so on and so on. That rationality should prevail after all the years of irrationality promoted um, by religions. So from that time we inherited the idea that there is like um, a contrast between rationality and emotions. So this is actually outdated since a couple of years. It's very clear from many psychological experiments that emotions and rationality always go together. They are, uh, who's interested in that, there's um, a famous uh, neuroscientist uh, called Antonio Damasio, uh, and he wrote a book called Descartes' Error, and he's describing the experiments he did to prove that emotions are so important for rational decision making. And he could show, for example, that in game situations, people who have damages of their brain and that who are not able to perceive emotions anymore, they are not able to make very rational decisions. So they are less uh, rational. So why is that so? The reason for that is that emotions always serve to inform us. They pre-inform us from something that we have learned before. I'm talking about that later a little bit more. So, but already since the 1960s with Herbert Simon, a uh, Nobel laureate for um, economics, uh, we talk also in social sciences of bounded rationality and we came to the conclusion, like the scientific community came to the conclusion, bounded rationality is actually enough. It's actually enough to come to quite good uh, ideas about what is best from my perspective, for, for what I want, for example, in economics or in politics. Um, to make it a little bit more plastic, um, we all know this situation, we talk to people and uh, we have opinions about all kinds of things. We're talking to them and all, everything is pretty clear. Um, right, in the mo right at the moment we know how to think about a certain issue and even if the issue is quite complex, very often we have the idea of, yeah, it's good or it's bad. So, um, that is, that is uh, uh, something that we are regularly um, doing. Um, but actually um, what we are concerned with is uh, how we look in the eyes of the other. That is what is more important for us than really to present uh, facts, for example, or a rational argument for something or against something. What does that mean? That does mean that um, we, in, in such a situation, we waste a lot of time by, um, by presenting our arguments to, to um, justify ourselves in the, in the eyes of the other. It's not so important if uh, I'm right or not. It's more important that the other side believes I'm right. And that is good for our uh, self-confidence. So we spend my most time and energy on defending our own beliefs, on our own idea about what reality is. And this is something that is happening very often also in political discussions. And that is, of course, uh, a, a problem. Um, because you cannot really talk about the issue, you talk about yourself, actually. A short introduction to uh, memory. We can decide a couple of different, or psychologists dis di differentiate between a couple of different memories. Two of the most important are the working memory and the long-term memory. The working memory is that what you experience now, right now. That what you can keep in your head just in the now. And that is the famous 7 plus minus 2 bits of information, which is almost nothing. So, and still, as I just explained, you can have ideas and, and beliefs and uh, 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 you know what is good and what is bad about so many so complex things. And that is because you have access to the so-called long-term memory where you store all what you have learned in your life. So it's, it's facts, it's your own opin opinions, it's, it's preferences, this is what what kind of newspaper you trust, what kind of politicians you trust, but also in your personal environment, it's just like that. There it is, but you do not have access to it, actually, um, because you're in your, in your working memory. But then, in the situation where you try to um, explain then, why do you have a, the opinion A, then you start digging into your long-term memory and then you try in, in the 
uh, after you made the decision already, you describe why you have this opinion. So, um, the term for this process is hot cognition. It's uh, very closely related to the um, uh, psychologists Lodge and Taylor. Hot cognition means that um, no information is processed without any bias. Because you learned in your life that a certain information was uh, coded within you positively or negatively. You had a positive emotion, that is the code, the emotion, uh, that is positive to certain things, whatever it is in politics, uh, or negative. And if you have ambivalent uh, 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 um, information that you do not uh, really know how it is it positive or is it negative, then it takes you much longer to come to a conclusion. But actually, that is the only time when you really are close to a more rational processing of the information that you have. But most of the time, we rely on hot cognition. We know before we talk about it, do I like it or don't I like it? And it's not very obvious for most people. You have to be very aware for that. It's, um, yeah, to use an old term, uh, subconscious. There's one, one more school, so to say, in this field of political science called effective intelligence. I do not want to talk too much about it. But this school states that actually, and they have proven that by several experiments in the United States, that um, people, voters especially, most of the time vote and behave politically like on autopilot. They do not think about it at all. I mean, think about um, your peers, your family, or whatever. Who is reading the programs of the parties? Who is really caring about this? And who does not vote out of a habit, for example? Or you vote what your parents voted. Or you uh, deliberately do not vote what your parents voted because you don't like your parents or whatever. But it's, most of the time it's like that. And even more unfortunate for, um, for democratic uh, theory is the younger studies that can show very clearly that the attractiveness of candidates is also very important if they are voted or not. So people do not care much about uh, politics. They care about what they like and what they don't like. And of course, it's important uh, which group you belong to. Um, is, it, is, it, is my opinion something that would kick me out the group or something that would integrate me more? Because people like to be integrated. That is one of the most um, important um, behavior patterns of human beings. Okay, a few words about political framing. You might have heard about that. Uh, political framing is also part of political propaganda. Uh, to use this old-fashioned but nevertheless adequate, uh, adequate um, term. Um, different topic, no, the same topic can be framed in different ways. A uh, very easy example is, for ex uh, is um, the issue of migration in uh, Europe or the EU, put it like that, and the United States. So migration from developing countries. Um, so if you want to address the liberal or socialist voters, you put it into the frame of human rights. Then you stress that, um, uh, that uh, the migration from, uh, 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 from, from countries uh, where civil war, uh, war or where people are starving or whatever, that this is a human rights issue and that we have to care about it in that way. So if you want to address um, conservatives or right-wing voters, um, you frame it as a security issue, issue and you talk about the likelihood maybe that uh, terrorists are coming to Europe within these groups of migrants or you talk about um, the social security systems that uh, uh, cannot cope with this uh, new mass of people who are um, not working. Yeah. So this is political framing and this is also happening very, very often. And you have to be aware of it because the information, how it is presented, already triggers so much in you that your decision is becoming, yeah, it's like it's not your decision anymore. It's uh, made from someone else. You have to be aware about what is really 
the issue here? Is there some reason to believe it's a human rights issue or a security issue? Then you can try to balance it for yourself. If you would read an article in the newspapers uh, telling you that they have a solution against the coronavirus, or let's put it, it should be something more dangerous than the coronavirus, a really deadly disease so that, that will kill everybody who's got in contact with it. So if you present the information um, like you have so and so much survivors, or you present it so and so many people will be killed, if we introduce a certain policy. So now let's come to the, what I think most uh, fascinating topic, identities. Um, so we all, I said that in the beginning when I was showing this picture of Barack Obama with his multiple identities, we all have multiple identities. So we are all like all in different positions. Actually India is one of the countries where people are more aware of it than somewhere else because it's pretty clear that they live in a pluralist society and they have so many different identifications that go beyond national identity, religious identity, uh, uh, gender identity, they have community identities and so on and so on and so on. So many different uh, identities so it's no wonder that it was one of the, um, that it was Amatya Sen. Uh, another economic uh, uh, Nobel uh, laureate uh, from, from uh, India, Northern India, uh, who's, who, who kind of termed uh, or kind of uh, coined this term um, multiple identities. Um, so, uh, why do I show you this picture here? Because gender identities are something that for most people are very, very deeply ingrained. So it's like the best example for identities. This is a picture, for example, from uh, South Africa uh, during the time of apartheid. So there you had restrooms for so-called whites and so-called colored people. And it's pretty much the same distinction. So you identify as that group or you identify as this group and then you know where to go to, if you like it or not. Maybe me as a man, I would like to go to the female toilet as well, but I don't do that. Yeah? And, um, that, that is uh, to, to uh, show you uh, how bad it can become if we just identify with things that we learned from outside society and we consider to be correct or not. So I think I don't have to um, talk a lot about um, apartheid uh, South Africa.